Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel that's found this morning in the gospel according to John, the 15th chapter, the 9th through the 17th verse. Jesus is speaking, and he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that your joy may be, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will then give you whatever you ask him in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I think that I have come across the perfect Mother's Day gift. I know that flowers are a really good gift. Flores tell us that Mother's Day is the second busiest weekend of the year, only behind Valentine's Day. And flowers are a wonderful gift. What mother doesn't like to receive a bouquet of beautiful flowers? And a telephone call is a good gift. Every mother wants to hear the voice of her child or her grandchild. Years ago, the legendary football coach at Alabama, Bear Bryant, was asked to film a commercial for South Central Bell Telephone. And the script called for him to tag the commercial with these words, call your mama. But when it came time to tape the commercial, Coach Bryant ad-libbed the ending, call your mama, I wish I could. I imagine that more people in Alabama call their mama that year than any time in history. A telephone call is a very good gift, but I think I've come across one that's even better. And it's one that was taught to me by my mother. Shortly after my brother got married, it dawned on me that my brother, my sister, and I, for the first time in our lives, we were all three on our own. Wendy and I had been married a few years, and we had one child, and we were living in Cartersville. My sister had gotten married, and she'd had her first child, and they were living in Newnan, Georgia. And then my brother had just gotten married, and he and his wife were living in LaGrange. And so I decided to get us together. I said, why don't once a month we get together for supper in Atlanta. Bring everybody together. And we started doing that. One month we would eat at Mary Max. Another month we'd eat at the Varsity. And each sibling got to choose a different restaurant each month. Well, I was visiting my mother and my daddy and mama said to me, when was the last time you talked to your brother or your sister? I said, well, we had supper together at the Varsity last weekend. She said, what? And I said, yeah, we, we did that. She said, what brought that on? I said, well, Mama, we've been doing it for the last few months. We've been getting together once a month for supper. She lit up like a Christmas tree. And she wanted to know details. She wanted to know what we talked about, what it was like, everything about it. And that's when it dawned on me. What Mama wanted, what she most wanted in life was for her children to love each other and to spend time with each other. 
And I think that she got that, inherited that from her heavenly father. For what God wants is for God's children to love each other and to get along with each other. That last night Jesus was with his disciples. They had the Passover meal together. And Jesus knew it was the last time they would all be together. The Romans were out to get him. The Jewish leaders were out to get him. And for some reason that no one could completely explain, even one of his friends was out to get him. And Jesus seemed to know even that. As you read the scene and envision it, it is pregnant with meaning. You see the shadows, the stillness, the hushed voices, the solemnity of the occasion. They all seemed to know it was their last time together. And Jesus said things to them that were important. After all, what do you say when you know it's the last time? Jesus said things like, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I am the vine and you are the branches. And we look back on those sayings and after Easter they take on a little bit of a different meaning, don't they? After Easter, it's like, oh, I know what Jesus was talking about when he said that. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Well, of course, Jesus is talking about what happened on the cross. I am the vine and you are the branches. Jesus is talking about his connection with God and his connection with the disciples And after Easter, it seems so clear and we understand it. And today we have one more of those sayings at the table. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus is commanding his disciples to love each other. When I heard that, I sort of went back to when I was a small child Growing up in the house, and my brother and my sister would get into it every now and then. And there would be arguing, and there would be screaming, and there would be pushing, and there would be crying, and mama would come running into the room. What's the matter? What's going on? And she would settle everybody down. She'd find out who started it, and then she would say, I want you to tell the other one you're sorry. Now I want you to tell the other one, I love you, and I want y'all to hug. And that's what I thought about when I read this passage, commanded to love. It doesn't always work out the way you think it should, being commanded to love. You don't always say, I love you, with the right emotion, with the right feeling. It's not quite as sincere as it's supposed to be. And I don't think that's what Jesus is saying at all when he says, love one another. Jesus describes this kind of love. He says, love one another as I have loved you. And then he describes that love. You didn't choose me. I chose you. That's the kind of love that Jesus has. It's not something that you earn or to deserve. It's something that Jesus freely gives. In other words, there wasn't an application down at the employment office to be one of Jesus' disciples. There was no long interview process. Jesus chose his disciples and said, I choose to love you. I choose for you to to be my disciple. Do you hear the intentionality of that? When I was seven, eight, nine years old, we lived in a neighborhood near town. And on the weekends, all the boys would gather on Saturday morning at the vacant lot. Most of the boys in my neighborhood were two or three years older than I was. 
We would play whatever get ball was in season, whether it was football or baseball. We'd get out there and there'd be two captains. They would choose up teams and we would play. I was one of the younger boys and so I stood on the fringes hoping to get chosen. Now can you imagine what it was like when the captain would look around and see the boys that were left over looking at me and looking at an older, bigger boy and then looking back at me, my heart beating out of my chest and he'd say, okay, we'll take Brit. To be chosen, to be selected, you talk about self-esteem. At that point, I wanted to prove the captain right for choosing me. I wanted to do my best. I wanted to make him proud. And that's what Jesus is doing with these disciples. I choose you to be my disciple. Jesus says, I intend to love you. I choose you to be my brother, my sister. The kind of love that Jesus had is one that told the truth. Jesus would tell you when you did something right. Jesus would encourage you, compliment you. And when you did something wrong, Jesus would critique you. And Jesus would help you get back on the right path again. Jesus would tell the truth. Have you had people in your life who will tell you the truth and encourage you? People tell you the truth when you're making a mistake and helping you get back on the right path. When I was serving a church in Cartersville, we had a partnership with an elementary school. And one day I was in the principal's office. We were having a meeting. The door was shut. She was behind her desk. I was in front of her desk. And there was a knock at the door, and the door opened, and here came a teacher pushing a little second grader in front of her. And you should have seen the look of terror on his eyes. And I thought, oh my goodness, I know what this is like. Being sent to the principal's office, what am I about to witness here? And the teacher said, I am so sorry to interrupt y'all, but this little boy needed to come see the principal. You see... I caught Jimmy doing something very good in class today. The principal got up out from behind her desk. She went over in front of him and she smiled and she knelt down and she said, Jimmy, is that true? Were you caught doing something good in class? Jimmy really didn't know how to answer the question. You could tell there was no saliva in his mouth whatsoever. And he just sort of barely got out the words, yes. And she hugged him. And she took a dish off her plate, off her desk that had candy in it. And she said, why don't you take a piece of candy with you and enjoy it for lunch? Well done, Jimmy. And as he left the office, I didn't see his feet hitting the ground. Uh, He was on cloud nine just floating out of that office. And it felt to me like we'd had church. It felt to me like God was present with us. And that love and that grace and that acceptance was beautiful. It happens all the time at our church. The instruction is loving. It's grace-filled. The outreach that we do is meant to help person live their very best life. And we look at people as our brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't watch the Oscars. I never do and I don't think I ever will. But after the two weeks ago, after the Oscars, I heard about something that happened They gave Tyler Perry an award, a humanitarian award, and people were buzzing the next day about his speech. Apparently, he got up and he thanked his mother for helping him to never blanket judge anyone. 
And he said, as a result of his mother's instruction, he refuses to hate anyone who is Mexican. And he refuses to hate anyone who is black or white or LGBTQ. He refuses to hate anyone who is a policeman. And he refuses to allow people to draw him into hating Asians. And he said, I dedicate this award to anyone who is willing to live life in the middle with me. The middle. I think it's a metaphor for choosing to love your brothers and sisters. Choosing to love them without condition. Refusing to blanket judge one another. It's what we need in this world. We live in a divided world. And we've got people who are on the far left and the far right. And it seems like we've got this big old umbrella that we're all trying to live under. And the people on the right are trying to pull the umbrella their way and say, "Uh, we need it to come our way because we're getting wet. And then there are people on the far left saying, no, pull the umbrella this way because we're getting wet. And those of us in the church who are standing at the center, holding the umbrella up, by the way, just say to others, if you'll all take a step towards the center, none of us will get wet. That's what needs to happen. We need to choose to love one another. To choose to refuse to judge one another. To choose to refuse to hate one another Because we're different from each other. So we hear the commandment from Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you. I think my mother would say that's the best gift anybody could give. To love children, to love your brothers and sisters, to love all of them. And God would agree. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.